Hey YouTube, it's JP Dillon with another useful service video on how to service your Marantz 2245 and 2270, both of which are essentially the identical machine, one running at a higher voltage for more power output. This video is going to cover the basics from chemically treating the switches and controls, replacing the lamps, and all of the little general maintenance things you should do to make sure that you don't have to mess with this thing for a while. So without further ado, the first thing we're going to do is get it out of the case, take the top off, take the knobs off, take the faceplate off, and take the bottom off, so you can get it ready for service. Okay, so here she is, apart and out of the case, with the faceplate off, feet off, bottom off, everything, so that you can get it ready for service. And this is looking into a 2270. The 2245 will look the same, except for a smaller power transformer. The uh, areas of concern are going to be your regulated power supply and protection circuitry, your switches and controls here along the front panel, lamps if you want to replace them, and then underneath the machine is the phono preamp and the main preamp and tone controls. And uh, depending on whether your machine exhibits symptoms of uh, rumbling and hissing and crackling when you change the uh, tone after cleaning the switches and controls, then you got to look at leaky capacitors here, uh, which is starting to be a very common thing on these machines. Now, if you want to, you can try to remove these button caps. I don't really re recommend it because, well, they tend, the plastic shafts on the switches are brittle and tend to break. So, the way that I recommend that you pursue this is you start by chemically treating all your switches and controls, deal with the problem in the power supply regulator and protection circuit, and usually that deals with the uh, timing capacitors and drive circuit for the relay. These capacitors get open and it will take a long time for it to come out of protect. If you've got a really early version of the machine that uses these Panasonic uh, purple electrolytics, check them to make sure they're not open. They do open. So let's get to it, and what I'll do is get the camera mounted, or at least show you in such a way that you'll be able to uh, service this thing. And as I have mentioned so many times before, it's a very good idea, hang on here, to put it in the service position that allows you to get to all the switches and controls. Let me shed some light on this. Everybody always wants to call when I'm closed. I think that's just so funny. Call from Anderson, Wendy. Okie dokie. So, get an extension on your deox straw, like I mentioned here. We'll start with the volume control. Spritz a little inside. Balance control. And you want to get down here into your tone control for your treble. Now, it's going to be hard to get to the mid-range one without pulling it out, but you can. That's what the long straw's for. We're just going to fish it in back here, and although the camera doesn't do a very good job of showing it, I can get it in there. And before we do the rest, you just turn these back and forth about 50 or 60 times to clean them up. So I'm going to do all the pots, and then I'll show you how to do the switches because it definitely takes some time and I only have an hour's worth on YouTube and I have to edit this down so that it fits because it does take probably the better part of an hour or two to service this thing. So I'm going to treat all the switches and controls and then we'll, or actually I'll do the controls first and then I'll show you the switches. And I recommend that you flip the machine over to do the base control and the input selector. It's going to make it easier on you. And if you want to use one of the knobs, you can to turn the input selector. Hang on a second, I want to show you guys something. Come on, focus! Ugh. Notice how when I turn that, the whole switch jiggles? Well, that's the case with any of your pots. Or switches, come over here and tighten these nuts. Don't let them be loose. You'll get little intermittent ground connections that will cause crackling and static when you change inputs. And then we'll just do the base control here. 
turn it about 20 or 30 times, preferably more. This is going to make your wrist hurt, so if you have arthritis, beware! Okay, uh, now to do the switches, what I usually recommend is to set it on its back, and if you're worried about it tipping over, I will stick a prop, like a screwdriver, about underneath midpoint of the chassis to keep it upright. So it's kind of like this. And then what I'll do is I'll put the sprayer on the lowest setting, and I'll just go in and squirt some into the switch here. Don't worry about getting the dial light and stuff dirty or wet with deox because you're going to clean that anyway and have to remove it to replace the lamps. Another note here, if you've got a power switch that's got a blue shaft, like you see there, that's made by Matsushita. See how it's sticky? Get a little bit of deox in there, but wait a good 20 minutes or so before you turn it on. The deox it will wash out the gunk. That's the uh, grease inside of there. And the reason why you don't turn it on for a while is give it time to evaporate, because if you leave the deox in there, the deox will burn from the arcing that's caused when the contacts close, and it will actually worsen the condition of the switch. Alright, so there's another note for you. Those switches oftentimes fail, um, and they are replaceable. There's stuff out there. You can talk to Duo Joe, which is the lamp guy from Marantz. He, I think he has power switches, and if not, Hollywood Beverly Electronics sells a switch that works very well for these, or at least most of them, that don't have the giant button uh, shaft on them. So I'm just working these switches, and we're going to do the other banks and then I'll show you how to burnish the relay on these things, and then we'll get to the protection circuit. Okay, as far as the protection circuit, the capacitors that commonly fail, I have tested these and they are good, uh, is the 220 microfarad, uh, you can use a 35 volt device, 47 at 10, you can use a 16 volt, 25 volt device, and a 10 microfarad at 50, these get leaky or they open up, and that will change the time constant to which the protection relay opens usually increases the time exponentially or it will cause the machine to drop out of protect without any kind of transient or anything that would suggest the amplifier is at fault. Now that relay gets touchy because people don't know about turning the volume down uh, when the set is turned off or on. Um, that's really important to do that. It saves wear and tear. Now what I have is a dental tool that has been notched out and what that does is that gets underneath and pulls back so that I can get the relay cover unlatched and I'll do it on the other side and get this off for you and then I'll show you how to burnish it. It requires two hands so I can't really just do it holding the camera. Um, the other option is is to mark the wires underneath, unsolder them and pull the relay out uh, you can replace it. I believe you can get these Omron MY2 series from DigiKey. Uh, I don't know if that's still true or not, but that was true a couple of years ago. But uh, if you can get the relay out and apart, then you can burnish the contacts, and that will tremendously improve its life. So let me do that. All right, so here's the relay with the cover off. And what you want to do is very carefully remove the spring. Don't lose it. And then... Pull forward and up and check your relay contacts. And as we can see, those ones are pretty crummy looking. Now, what I will use is some uh, 2000 grit to polish them up. And again, I need two hands to do this, so bear with me just one second. I'm trying to do this in such a way that you guys can see what I'm doing. Because there's no real way to prop the camera here, at least at a decent angle. We're going to do some photographic trickery here, if this will stay put. Nope. <laughs> Alright, stay there. Alright, so there's our contacts. And what I'm going to try to do is 
here's the back side of them which look ugly and burned and I'm just going to take our sandpaper this is a 2000 grit and I'm just going to resurface it so yeah it makes it nice and shiny and pretty no more carbon and junk there that's important to do that otherwise you'll have channels dropping out at lower volumes now you have to do the other contacts at the base which is what sucks without taking the relay out and I'm going to see if I can put the spring back in here without having it fly off into oblivion this is why you have tools make sure that's in there now I'll take that same piece of uh, sand, uh, sandpaper and a pair of hemostats See, I got it gripped here, and I will go with the rough side facing inward, if it will hold for me. Yeah, these ones are worn out. Lovely. Let's see if I can get another set here, or just a pair of plain old. Here we go. And I'm going to work in the sandpaper between the contacts there. Press to actuate the relay and go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And do this for a little bit. And that's going to burnish the other side of the contacts you need to burnish too. All right, so that's in there now. And then we'll just put the cover back on the relay. All right. And then what we'll do is we'll replace the three capacitors and then I'll move on to uh, the lamps and we'll show you how to do the lamps. All right, so we got our uh, new caps in there, three of them there. The old ones tested bad, just as I thought they would. So now what you have to do is you have to tackle the lamps. This is probably the most difficult project. Somebody's already been toying this one and they lost the little cap for the uh, dial pointer lamp. That's lovely. Um, the first thing I recommend that you do before you take anything apart is remove the guide. Excuse me, there's a little piece of something here. Remove the guide here for the dial pointer leads. Um, this will cause you lots of headaches if you try to leave it in there. It's going to give you more room to work, and you're going to need it. I don't recommend trying to replace everything from the rear like they suggest in the service manual. You got to take all these screws loose and then you got to back the tuner up because there isn't enough room to get it out from behind. So you know what? Don't do that. Just it's too risky. You might break the dial string. You're going to want to loosen these two screws here, which are just number one Phillips. And then once you get that out, then you're going to find it's really fun because the rest of it's glued on. And you're going to have to be very, very careful to get this off without cracking or breaking it. Uh, the later ones used a bar along the bottom here which pressed up against this to secure it. Much better idea. All right. So the next thing you're going to want to do is from the top with a nice sharp X-Acto. Get as close to the metal as you can and start etching away at the glue. And you got to be really careful because if you slice the uh, vellum paper, you're going to have to replace that too, and that's not very fun because you have to find it. And we're just going to keep going down here. And we're going to get the top portion loose. Feels like it's almost ready. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, you might want to get a long, flat-bladed, small screwdriver like this. And what you're going to want to do is, now that you've gotten this away, you're going to want to push very carefully 
along the top here to loosen this side like that and then come up here and get it down in here so that you can loosen this side and then hopefully if the glue is nice to you it will give and this will come away like so there's your vellum paper be very careful this is like fragile as rice paper and you don't want to destroy it this is where all the patience comes into play and you have to do this now the problem here with this one it's already starting to disintegrate because we've got little bitty hairline cracks and stuff here uh, so very carefully behind the vellum paper cut and peel it away from the chassis here and just take your time don't try to go fast just take your time I don't know I can't stress that anymore just take your time because like I said if you screw it up you gotta find a replacement so I'm gonna just work at this really easy and we're gonna get it out and then I'll show you how to do the lamp okay so once you get your vellum paper out this is what you're looking at there are status lamps here which you'll need to replace and there are dial lamps here which you need to replace these are the easy part now if your Marantz has a metal housing you can use up to 250 milliamp year lamps the stock ones are 200 I would recommend using 200 but 200s are hard to get unless you go through Dwoja or somebody that knows what they're selling you can use LEDs but it's going to compromise the color and make it look nice and dark blue if you use a warm white it's a little bit better but their concentrated spotting usually makes it look kind of funny that's entirely up to you now if your Marantz has a dropping resistor of 18 ohms between the main between the main assembly and the uh, upper assembly you're using 6.3 volt lamps if it is a jumper without a resistor you're using 8 volt lamps <coughs> Now, on these, where you see a group of two, uh, which is hard to see in there, but it does exist. There's a group of two lamps in there. That's your stereo indicator. Those are two 6.3 volt in series. The rest of them are either 6.3 volt 40 milliampere or 8 volt 40 milliampere, depending on what your configuration is. Now, in order to replace these, you better be a good solderer because you're going to need a 50 watt iron. Uh, some really good wick and a lot of patience. Now, the best way to pursue this is by uh, desoldering. You can't see it because that's in the way. Desoldering the little jumper resistor there. You want to take that out. And then there are screws that hold the upper portions to the lamp housing, which you want to remove. This part of it totally sucks because you're going to have to finagle this thing out of here. And the reason why you don't want to leave it in here is because if you nick the dial cord, you're going to have to restring the tuner, and that's not very fun on these machines. So avoid that at all costs. So we're going to get the two screws that hold the upper portion of the dial uh, status lamps in there. Excuse me. Get out of there. Get off of my screwdriver. Magnetic screwdrivers are both a blessing and a curse. Okay, and we're going to bend away this clip down here. If the camera will focus. There we go. Bend this away. So you've got free movement of these wires. And then without screwing up the dial pointer or the dial string, you can take this back. Now... Um, let's see, I haven't unsoldered that, but you get the idea. And you're going to get this up and out of here best possible. In fact, I am just going to cut this out because I already have a resistor to replace it with. If you don't, desolder it. Sometimes I have advantages that others do not. And you're going to want to lift as you rotate so that the lamps face up so that you can lift it out this requires two hands guys sorry but I'm gonna have to pause the video for just a moment all right so now that it's out you can see here that it does have the uh, 6.3 volt 40 milliampere lamps 
and the two in series. Somebody has already attempted to replace these once, and their solder work sucks. Uh, so we're going to have to redo all of that. But we're replacing them anyway, so who cares? They also didn't do a very good job of inserting them. So, uh, let me get the camera on a place where I can hold it, and then I'll show you how to properly desolder it and replace it and resolder it. So give me a second here. All right, I'm going to try to do this so you guys can see what's actually required. You get yourself some really good solder wick. Like uh, this Chemtronics Chemrick Rosin. I really like it. It's very effective. Again, make sure you're not going to sever your dial string or anything like that. Let's just pick a random lamp here. Get a nice hot 50 watt iron. And just use the wick and pull the old solder away. And if you hurt the lamp a little bit, who cares? You're replacing it. All right. Okay. And once you get that desoldered, you pull the little bugger out. And there it is. So you got to do that with all of those status lamps and then reinstall the housing. And um, so that's how we do that. Now the uh, replacing the dial lamps is pretty easy. You're literally just taking, you know, you can use a small screwdriver or my fancy dental tool, whatever, and just pry them out here. Those are replaceable. Uh, the other one is a little more of a challenge. You have to undo those two screws down there. There's one there and there's one there. You undo them and you have to slide this out. You may want to take loose the AM radio board here to give you a little more space, pull it up and kind of to the side. And you're probably going to have to use hemostats to change the bulbs in these. That kind of sucks. But uh, that's how we do the lamps. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and uh, dust the chassis out a little bit here. And then I'll show you what's going on that you need to do if your phono preamp has a certain uh, complement of parts in it. And then what we'll do is we'll fire it up and we'll test to see if we need to do the capacitors in the preamp too. And then I'll discuss uh, setting the bias and stuff like that. Okay, dokie, so all of our fancy new lamps are in. The only thing I haven't replaced is the dial pointer yet. That is an 8 volt 60 milliamp here with long leads. Again, you can get this from Dwojo, Dave Warshanowski, great guy. Um, and that, you can do it one of two ways. You can either splice it in with the heat shrink tubing he provided, which I recommend because that's a tight spot to solder in. Or if you want to be brave, you can desolder the two lead test points down there, one on that terminal strip and the other one on the main light bar, and get that out. So, if you're going to uh, splice it, he does provide a piece of heat shrink tubing you can cut in half, uh, which will require that you have a heat gun or a hair dryer to shrink it down. This is missing the cap, so I'm just going to use a piece of tape to hold it there. So, yeah, that person is very persistent in calling. Still not open yet. All right, so let me replace that, and then we'll uh, dust it out, fire it up, and see what it does. If you guys want to see a splice, here's how you splice it. Number one, measure and cut your wire and strip about maybe an eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch off. Cut your two heat shrink pieces down and slide them over the wires. Or Actually, before you do that, let's twist these up a little bit so that they don't get in the way of things. All right, so twist them up, slide your heat shrink down as far away from your solder points as you can so that the heat from the solder doesn't cause the thing to prematurely shrink. Take some solder and your iron and tin both sides. All right, again, hot iron is the key here. This makes it fast and efficient. Touch the two leads together you wish to bind, quickly solder them, and there's your splice, and then slide the heat shrink over your splices and heat them up. Now my heat gun is dead, so you can use either the butt of the soldering iron like this in a rolling motion until they adhere. Or you can use a lit match and just uh, 
about maybe an inch or so from the flame, you can get them to shrink down and do what you need to. So there's your splice. That gets everything happy. All right, let's uh, put the faceplate back together and fire this thing up. All right, so I got this back together enough that we can test it and see how it works. Let's see what, how we did with our lamps. Pretty. Comes right out of protect. Stereo lamp works, dial pointer lamp works, all that stuff works. Wonderful. So we've got it in an auxiliary, we've got a load hooked up, and we've got a signal generator hooked up. Let's see if it passes signal. Nope, it does not. Ah, and that is because the pre out main end jumpers on the back are missing. So let me quick get a cable to put all that together, and then we'll check it and see what our... All right, let's take two on that one. Got the jumpers in. Let's see here. Pretty sure I got everything hooked up. We got one channel there. Nothing on the left side. Interesting, but the right looks clear. Adjusting the tone controls, I don't have that horrible transient rumble, so that's good. Tells me the caps are in good shape. Let's check our wiring here. Don't know why that is the way it is. Yeah, it should be okay. So we've got other issues. Interesting. When I tap the relay, it gets temperamental. Little tiny signal. Uh, tape monitor switch is touchy. There we go. We still need to go through that one a little bit more Get it in the right spot. It'll work Okay, so I've got more stuff to go over uh, Probably just do another round of deox on that face plates coming off so I can detail it anyways now final aspects of this uh, What I might tell you is that the Phono stages in these have two transistors in the output, one here and one here. These ones have already been replaced by somebody with 2SC1775s, which was the time, uh, the transistor of choice back then. Uh, you can, they're normally 2SC458s. If they're 2SC458s, get them out of there. They're leaky, they're noisy, they're bad. You can replace it with a 2SC1775. Uh, 2SC2240, 2SC2547. Low noise, mid gain transistor with about 200. Now, as far as doing the setup adjustments, get a voltmeter on your millivolt meter range with the speakers disconnected. The outer pot here is your DC offset adjustment. There's one here, and the opposite one is on the bottom. Adjust it for zero volts after it's been on about 10 minutes. And then once it's had a chance to warm up, adjust your bias per your service manual. I don't recall exactly what it is. Uh, I think it's about 14 millivolts across the uh, emitter resistors. On these, you can actually, some of them are wired in such a way that the collectors are in the output circuit. So you can do a plus and minus on the collector and uh, get that millivolt reading there. But... I hope this has been useful to you guys. This is just kind of a basic service. I really don't have enough time to go through a complete and total restoration, but this will at least give you some idea as to how to tackle your 2245 or 2270. And I hope this video has been useful to you. And uh, more stuff to come soon. Thanks for watching.